Well, as, as I was coming back from um, vacation and seeking to um, figure out what the next text, you know, should be from the book of Romans, I, I was tempted just to launch into the meat of Romans 9. But as I read these first few verses, I thought, I, just got, I can't just pass over these and deal with them just briefly. Uh, we're going to lose the whole Im impact of it. And so as I began working on this, I noticed that it, it, it filled up a rather <laughs> large portion and became more than a sermon in itself. So um, I, I really want us to focus on this expression, on, on this um, self-revelation, uh, so to speak, that uh, Paul gives us of himself. You know, he's been dealing with theology uh, through the book. He did give some personal comments throughout. He did talk about at the beginning how much he wanted to come to the Romans. He talked about in Romans 7 his struggle, his personal struggle with, with sin. But here he gives us some more personal insight into his heart, uh, and particularly, again, his affection for the Jews. Um, amazing, in, especially in light of the way they treated him. Um, but um, so let's just kind of soak this in, and we're going to try to understand this. And I do want to orient us to what Paul is, is building up to here. I mean, he doesn't say this for no reason. He's not just interjecting some unrelated comment. We're going to see how it fits, but um, I want us to see this, though, in particular. So Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, Paul says this, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Notice that little doxology at the end as Paul's talking about these things about Christ. He can't help but glorify him. Well, so again, this is what we want to consider this morning. And so what I'd like to do to begin is just give a very brief um, summary of what we've seen so far in the book of Romans that's going to line us up with where he's heading in the next three chapters, and then we'll see how this passage that we just looked at fits into that, that whole thing. So Paul has been showing us that everyone is guilty, okay, Jews and Gentiles. The Jews, because having the law of God, they broke it. The Gentiles, because knowing God in revelation or through natural revelation, they reject him and suppress that. And knowing what he requires in their conscience, they also break the law. Paul says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so all are under the curse. Remember, the wages of sin is death. And that's not just physical death. That's judicial death, spiritual death in hell forever. Paul said that to show us why we need the gospel, why everybody needs Jesus. Now, he went on to say that the only way we can be acceptable to him is through faith in Christ. We can't be good enough on our own. God did not accept Abraham because he was good, because he kept the law. He didn't accept Abraham because he was circumcised, which is what the, the Jews thought, the law and circumcision, that's all they needed. No, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. God gave him the only righteousness that would make him acceptable, that of his son, through faith. That is how we are justified, by trusting in Christ. But being in Christ by faith, you know, it, it, it changes us, okay? Paul is, is, goes on to say, it makes us into new creatures. And the reason, he said, is because in a very real sense, when Jesus died on the cross, we died with him. And when we died with him, we died to sin. And when he was raised, we were raised with him to life. The old has passed away. 
the new has come. And so Paul says we are no longer to give ourselves to sin, but to God to live the kind of life he calls us to live. That's, that's what this blessing of justification calls us to. But Paul went on to remind us that isn't going to be easy. Even though our old man was crucified, he's still very much alive. Paul tells us personally that even though he delighted in God's law, he often found himself doing the very things he hated. And the same is certainly true of us. The good news is, though, that in Christ we will not be condemned. Jesus has taken away all of our guilt, past, present, and future. And Paul as quickly reminds us that he's also given us his Holy Spirit to empower us to live in the way that he calls us to live. We need to remember the work of Christ was aimed at two things. Again, as Top Lady reminds us, you know, cleanse me from this guilt, but take away also its power. He has taken away our guilt, but he's also broken the power of sin. And Paul went on to tell us that when we see that work of the Spirit in our lives, that shows us that we are his children. And if we know that we are his children, we also know that nothing in heaven or earth can ever separate us from his love for us in Christ. Again, what a, what a wonderful... <laughs> blessing in a wonderful way to sort of, you know, end that section uh, before we took this little bit of a break uh, where we um, were looking at Psalm 139. Now, this morning, I want us to see that Paul changes direction, okay? He begins to focus on the Jews. Now, what he's doing here is he's addressing an issue that has been raised by what he has just said, and we need to understand what that issue is. Now, remember who the Jews are. They are those that God made his covenant with. Remember, God made his covenant with Abraham and with his children. And in those covenants that he made with them, he also made certain promises to them. And what are those promises? To send the Messiah who would save them and would bring them into the new heavens and the new earth, essentially making the same promises to them that have been made to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, look at the condition of the Jews, you know, at that time. Most of them, not just many, but most have fallen short. They have rejected Christ. They're not going to see the new heavens and the new earth, and, and I think that's ultimately what happened to the majority of them. So the question is, if God could make his covenants and promises with them, and they could fall short. Could not the same thing happen to us? How can we have assurance that we're actually going to see heaven? Well, I think you know from reading those chapters that Paul is going to go on to show us, show the Romans, that God did keep his promise to the Jews, to Israel, the promises he made. Because he will tell us in verse 6, of Romans 9, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Okay, God never made that promise to all natural Israel. He made that promise to spiritual Israel or to those who are chosen. But before he sets out to prove this, Paul first wants to express something of his heart toward the Jews that we should take note of. And how would he characterize this? He expresses the strongest possible affection for the Jews. Verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now, if you understand what he's saying there, that is remarkable. Well, that's what we want to consider this morning. Okay, what did Paul mean by this? And what's going on here? I think what we're going to see is really the, the secret, if I could use the word secret, of his zeal for the Lord, of his zeal for evangelism, of everything Paul did, everything Jesus did, everything that Moses did. It's all motivated by love. Okay, now, so what does Paul mean by this statement, first of all? Well, there, there have been those who have suggested that he doesn't really mean what he says here. Some think he might be referring to his willingness here to be rejected by the Jews 
in order to bring Christ to them. And what they perhaps are thinking is that, you know, the Jews had a belief of who the Messiah was and what he would do. And Paul was presenting to them a different idea. Uh, the true Christ, of course. But as he presents this to them, they hated Paul. They rejected Paul. And they put him out, at least from, in their minds, of the Jewish church. So in their minds, he would be rejected or cut off from Christ. And Paul was willing to do that if he could bring the true Christ to them. Okay, well, that's one idea. Another idea is that Paul was saying that, that he had the love of Christ in his heart for them. And he would be willing to go to the cross as Jesus also went to the cross for them if, if it meant it might save them. But that, that's obviously beyond the realm of possibility. Paul needed a Savior. He couldn't be a Savior. But still, I think most, I don't know if I can say most commentators because I haven't read them all, but I would say that um, certainly there are those who believe that what Paul means here is what he says. They take what he says at face value, that he was willing forever to be separated from Christ, to be plunged into hell if it meant that he might save the Jews. Now, you know, what, what an extraordinary comment, but I think that's the way we need to take it, particularly in light of what, the way he prefaces what he says. Why does he say what he says in the first couple of verses? I am telling the truth in Christ. Why would he have to say that? I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren. Notice he calls on Christ to bear witness to what he's saying is true. He affirms he is not lying. And he says that his sanctified conscience, you know, the Holy Spirit having sanctified his conscience, convinces him that he really means this, that he'd be willing to be damned for the Jews. Now, how could Paul mean that? You know, I remember that... Um, Jonathan Edwards, uh, in his day, there was, a, there was a movement in the church of people who said that I love the Lord so much that if the, I, I would do anything for him and, and I would be willing even to be damned for God if, if that's the way he wanted to glorify his name in me. So great is my love for him. Well, Jonathan Edwards said, what kind of love is that? If you really love God, you want to be with him. You wouldn't want to be separated from him. You know, so some would, would you know, we, we look at this and we say, well, is this the, the same thing? I mean, Paul's greatest desire was to be with Christ. He said in Philippians 1.23, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. You know, Paul loved the Lord more than anything. Well, I think we need to understand that Paul is not, saying to the Roman Christians here that he doesn't want to be with Christ. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying in the strongest possible way is that he wants his fellow Jews to be with him as well, to be with Christ. Uh, that it's better, I think he goes even further and said, it's better that, if one, that one person perish than that the whole nation perish and that he's willing to make that sacrifice. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, verse 13? Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus, in fulfilling this, loved us so much that he was willing to be condemned in our place, to be cut off from God, to suffer hell in order that he might save us. Now, Paul is expressing the same desire. Now, we saw earlier in a meditation that Moses did exactly the same thing. Again, after this sin regarding the golden calf and the Lord threatened to destroy them, then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, the people has created a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. And if not, please blot me from your book which you have written. What book was that? Well, it's believed that he's referring to the book of life in which God has registered those who belong to him. 
Moses was saying that he too was willing to be condemned if it might save his people. And by the way, we need to, to realize that you know, Moses is really a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing this, he was pointing to the one, Jesus, who actually would do this for us. Okay? Now, um, he didn't, of course. I mean, we need to remember that what Paul and Moses were asking here was not really possible. God would never condemn the innocent with the guilty. And so we read in verse 33, the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. We need to remember that Jesus, too, was not, um, how, how would we say, he, he was not an example of an innocent man who was condemned, though he was innocent in himself. Our sins were imputed to him, the guilt of our sins, and he became guilty in our place. And when God punished him, he was punishing someone who was guilty, vicariously guilty, okay? Um, so God would not punish an innocent man. Moses, you know, he reminds Moses of that. Who, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Paul when he says what he says, realizes that this was really also the case. Because notice what he says. I could wish that I were accursed. I could wish this. But he doesn't say, I wish. Because he knows it wasn't possible. That God would not do that. But he wanted these believers to know, these Roman Christians, that if it was possible, that he would do it for the sake of his brethren. Now, when you think about that, it's no wonder that Paul was willing to do all that he did, to will, willing to suffer all that he did in bringing the gospel to the Jews because of how much he loved them. Now, we might ask the question, why did he love them so much, you know, especially in light of the way that they treated him? Well, certainly it was because of the Spirit's work in his heart. You know, the Spirit is the Spirit of love, and that's what He creates in our souls, and Paul could not love them apart from the Holy Spirit, but that's assumed. Paul gives a couple of more reasons. He says it's also because they were his family, his kinsmen according to the flesh. You know, what, what would one not do for one's family? You know, we, we love those who are closest to us, and he identified as a Jew. He never, you know, lost that identification. But I think the main thing he points to here was not his love necessarily for them, um, well, the love of the Spirit or the fact they were his kinsmen, but he points to the fact that God loved them. Look at what he says. Well, oh, let, me, let me just back up for a second. Now, Paul is going to tell us in Romans 11, verses 28 and 29, something that I've had to wrestle with for years, and I, I think I understand what he's saying here. But listen. He says, from the standpoint of the gospel, talking about the Jews, they are enemies for your sake, for the sake of the Roman Christians. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now, he's going to explain in these chapters that God is not referring to the entire nation, he is referring to the elect, but sometimes that's hard to separate, isn't it? Uh, so we should note that God often dealt with the entire nation very graciously for the sake of the elect. We need to remember that God is dealing with the entire world right now graciously for the sake of the elect, isn't he? Why does the world continue? Because God's people live here and because there are more yet to be called. And so God does good things. And, and for the nation of Israel, he did many good things for the sake of his servant Abraham, but also for the sake of the elect. Now, Paul says in, in verses 4 through 5, specifically what was true of them and why it is that he loved them. He says, they are Israelites to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh? Now, by Israelites, he means that they're children of Jacob. I think you know from the Old Testament that Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and 
Israel means man of God. And there are times in the Bible where, you know, the Bible is calling Jacob, Jacob, but when his faith revives, then it calls him Israel, you know, the man of God. Well, these are the children of Israel, Israelites. They were also God's children. God had taken Abraham and his children to be his by adoption. You know, this is, again, the issue that Paul's going to deal with in these chapters. So all these things are true of the Jews. How come they're, they're falling away and they're not receiving Christ? But God said to Moses when he sent him to speak to the king of Egypt in Exodus 4, verse 22, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. You see how the Lord just basically catches all the people of God up in this one statement, and he says he loves them. You know, that, that's this covenant solidarity that exists in Israel. That's why sometimes it's hard to separate God's love for the Jews as a nation and God's love for his elect as, as individuals within that nation because of this solidarity. God had given them the tokens of his presence among them. He gave them the Ark of the Covenant. He gave them the Shekinah glory. He made his covenants with them, the Abrahamic and the Mosaic and the Davidic covenants, as well as the new, which he would make with them, that would be the fulfillment of all of these things. He gave them his law to teach them right from wrong and to show them how they could walk with him. He gave them the temple service that pointed to the one who would take away their sins. He gave them his promises through these covenants, the promise of the coming Messiah, of forgiveness through him, and of the fact that he would raise him up to be a benevolent, a benevolent ruler over them. Theirs were the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And from them came the Christ, okay, at least according to his human nature. Remember, Jesus is the son of Abraham, the seed through whom all the nations would be blessed. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He comes from the line of Judah to reign. He is the son of David. Jesus is a Jew, okay? Well, that was a great privilege that the Jews had on top of all these other privileges that Jesus would come from their line. But we need to remember that he's much more than that, Paul says. He's also the son of God. Now, I'm going to criticize the NASB and the KJV, because oddly enough, they, they translate this last part of verse 5 in exactly the same way. And I would say it's not so much a poor job of translation as it is a poor job of word order because it gives you the wrong impression. So speaking of the Christ, both of these versions say that Paul is saying, you know, from whom is the Christ, who is over all, God bless forever. Okay, now this can be understood correctly, but it does sound like Paul is saying that Jesus is blessed of God. He's over all, he's been exalted, and he's blessed of God. Well, that's great, that's magnificent, but that's not nearly what Paul is saying. What he's really saying here, and this is one of the clearest places in the Bible, he actually does say it. He's saying Jesus is God. The ESV puts the word order in a better way you know, a better position. And it reads this way. From whom is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Okay? So he is God, the one who is over all. And certainly he is blessed forever. So what Paul is saying here is that when the eternal Son of God came into this world, by taking our nature, he came through the Jews. But the one who came... Is God in our nature. So the Jews were uniquely loved and blessed by God because of his choice of Abraham, and that's why Paul also loved them and desired their salvation. Now, I'm sure that as I've been going through this and, and through the service, we've all been challenged, you know, by this example of Paul, and I do want us to think about what we should take away from this. Well, first of all, I think, I think we already have. I mean, we'd be, have hearts of stone if we didn't, but we should think about the condition of our own hearts. How much do we love and desire the salvation of others? 
Now again, thinking about Paul, why was Paul so zealous in bringing the gospel to the Jews? Why was he tireless and so industrious in reaching out to them? Why was he willing to endure such hardship in doing this? I mean, on one occasion, remember, the, the, the Jews dragged him outside the city and stoned him to death and left him for dead. And when he got up, he went back into the city and just continued the work, you know, not necessarily in that city, but he did continue to go and reach out to the Jews. Paul gives us a catalog of the many things he was willing to suffer in 2 Corinthians. And the question is, why was he willing to do that? to suffer so much in bringing the gospel to the Jews? Well, it was because of love. Can you think of anything that is more powerful, more compelling than this affection, particularly this affection energized by the Holy Spirit? Remember that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, love does not seek its own, but it seeks the good of those who are loved. Why did Jesus become a curse for us and die for us on the cross. It was because he loved us. That's why he did it. Loved his father as well, but it was for love that he did it. Now, was Paul's love just for the Jews? He seems equally to have laid himself out for non-Jews as well, the Gentiles. Okay. Why? Well, again, it was because of love. Jesus did say, as we've already seen, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Paul sought to accomplish this or to apply this consistently. The Gentiles were as much his neighbors as the Jews. And we could also argue they were, they were also family members. You know, we, we actually do come from the same, you know, the same uh, parents, uh, ultimately. So remember that Paul was not just given a commandment and, and he was trying to kind of work this out on his own. But the Lord gave him the commandment and he gave him his spirit and the spirit put the love in his heart and the commandment then showed him the direction in which to express that love and that's what he was doing, both toward the Jew and toward the Gentile. Now, we know that Paul loved the Jews because they were his kinsmen, as I've already said, but in a very real sense, everyone in the world was his relative. Everyone in the world is our relative, our kinsmen. Okay? They're all distant cousins, many times removed. But we all came from the same parents, Adam and Eve, which means we are all of the same family. Remember how Ken Ham often tells us there are not many races, there's only one, the human race. There's different cultures. But we are all of the same family, and that's the reason why we too should care about the people who are around us. But there's another reason, again, this is the one that Paul's going to deal with in the next few chapters, the same reason that Paul loved both Jews and Gentiles, and that is because some of them were beloved by God. They were his elect. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 10, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David according to my gospel, notice, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not in prison. Why are you doing this, Paul? For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it, eternal glory. Now, think about this, though. You know, Paul was enduring these things for the sake of, of the elect, and he was reaching out to Jews and Gentiles, but does that mean he was reaching out only to the elect? Well, of course not, because nobody knows who they are but God. But he knew that as he reached out to both Jews and Gentiles, being motivated by this love, that he would reach those who were foreloved by God. And so he was willing to spend and be spent for them. And so we should love the lost because they are our neighbors. We should love the lost because they are members of our family. And we should love them because some of them are foreloved by God. It, we, we need to have love as a motive. But also let's not forget 
that there's another source of love besides these motives, okay? There's the Holy Spirit. We need to pray that God would give us more of His Holy Spirit, and we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit, and there's really a good reason why, because to the degree that we are not, we are not loving. We do not have that intensity of love. We are under the control of something else other than love. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. We also need to pray, and this is another external motivation, but a very powerful one, and one that uh, Dr. Reeves is going to remind us that the Puritans often reminded their people of. He wanted them, or the Puritans wanted them to fall in love with Christ. And so they would often express all that Jesus has done, which is, again, what we want to do as we look through the Word of God. So we need to pray that God would reveal to us more of the love that Jesus has shown us and that the Father has shown us in Christ because that will motivate us also to love. And, and what better demonstration is there of that than this, the table that is laid before us this morning because it reminds us that God so loved us that he gave his son for us. And it reminds us that Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to become accursed for us, separated from God, in order that he might redeem us. And he actually did go through that on the cross in order that he might take us to himself and love us as his own forever. Okay, that kind of love is meant to motivate us to love others and to have the same kind of heart that Paul had to reach out so that those who are foreloved by God might also have this relationship with him and this glory that is in Christ Jesus. Well, as we think about these things, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord um, to work this love in our hearts, to encourage us as we come to the table and, and not to forget, again, this desire that Paul had and that Moses had, that was simply reflecting Jesus, right? And are we not predestined to be con become conformed to his image? That means that this is what the Lord desires in us as well. So th these are not one-offs. Th these are examples, okay, of, of what the Lord intends for us. So we that we grow in this kind of love and desire because this is what is going to enable us uh, to do what he calls us to do. Well, let, let's, let's pray.